Hi chemists. In this unit, we are now going to be focusing on acids, bases, and solutions. So this video is an introduction to solution properties. After today, you should be able to explain the differences between the three different types of solutions, describe how to make a supersaturated solution, and describe how to increase the rate of dissolving for a solute. If you recall from early on in the school year, you probably learned that a solution is a homogeneous mixture. The components are not chemically combined and they retain their original properties. So an example of this would be dissolving sugar in water. You know if you were to take a sip of that sugar water, it would still taste sweet, which is an indicator of the fact that both substances retain their properties. A solution is divided up into two parts, the solute and the solvent. The solute is usually a dissolved substance. So for example, with the sugar water example, sugar would be the solute. And the solvent is usually the most abundant component of a solution. This is usually considered what does the dissolving. So for example, that would be the water in the last example. Water is often called the universal solvent, and it's because it has the ability to dissolve so many substances. Recall an aqueous solution is where water is the solvent. For example, if you were to take sodium chloride as a solid and then put it in water, just like you see the little H2O over the yield sign, what you'll get is sodium ions and chloride ions. We say that the substance will dissociate or separate from each other in water. And so those water molecules work to separate the sodium ions from the chloride ions in that sodium chloride lattice. Solubility is defined as the maximum amount of solute dissolved in a specific solvent at a specific temperature. When we say a solution is saturated, what that means is that no more solute can dissolve. So for example, if you were to add, um, let's say, salt to water so that the solution was considered saturated, if you added any more salt, it would not dissolve. Instead, it would kind of just sink to the bottom and you would see it on the bottom there. Conversely, if you had an unsaturated solution, that's where the solution can dissolve more solute. So if you added more sodium chloride, it would dissolve. And so that would tell you that the solution is unsaturated. But one term you might not be familiar with is a supersaturated solution. A supersaturated solution is where you have more solute dissolved than is theoretically possible. And you may say, how can you do this if it's not theoretically possible? How does this happen? So let's talk a little bit about how to make one. So what you do is you have to add more solute than the solubility of the solvent allows, right? So you're just going to add a whole lot of solute. And then what you do is you heat the solution up, like over a Bunsen burner, for example, or on a hot plate. And then finally, you have to slowly cool it down. And the reason why you have to slowly cool it down is because you don't want to have any of that solute come out of solution. So this is often referred to as a very temporary and, an, and unstable state for a solution. So what that means is any disturbance will actually cause the solute to precipitate out. Let's talk about some factors that will affect solubility. So remember solubility is the amount of substance that can dissolve, right, at a specific temperature in a given amount of solvent. So first one is temperature. Like I kind of already talked a little bit about how to make a supersaturated solution right? We have to trick the solution into dissolving more than is possible. So kind of altering the temperature allows that to happen. So most solid substances, I mean, there are a few exceptions, but most solid substances for the most part have higher solubility as temperature increases. All gas solutes, however, actually have lower solubility as temperature increases. So if you think about, for example, flat soda, right? If soda is sitting out for a long time, you know that eventually that um, carbon dioxide that has been dissolved is going to come out. That's mostly because the temperature has now increased and caused that carbon dioxide to flow out of the soda. 
pressure also will affect gaseous solutes. So if you um, think about like, it, that's why a lot of soda is packed under pressure because we want to kind of force those bubbles into the liquid. So um, all gas solutes, no matter what they are, will have higher solubility as the pressure above them increases. So let's talk a little bit about solubility curves. Um, these are just a really great way to kind of summarize the point at which substances are going to be saturated, unsaturated, or supersaturated. So if you first want to take note of what's on the x-axis, so notice we have temperature. And then on the y-axis, you have the grams of salt in solution. So remember, salt is just a, ter a generic term for anionic compound. And then notice that um, it is specified that it's in 100 grams of water. So basically, the idea with these solubility curves is it helps you to know where that solution is going to be saturated. So like, let's say, for example, I want to know how much potassium chromate um, actually, I think that's actually potassium dichromate, how much potassium dichromate I can add to 100 grams of water at 50 degrees Celsius. What you would do is you would find 50 degrees Celsius, and then you would say, okay, if here's 50, I'm going to go up to this line for potassium dichromate, and it looks like at that temperature, approximately 30 grams can stay dissolved. So that's right where you see this intersect right here. So when you say that, that basically means that at 50 degrees Celsius, 30 grams of potassium dichromate can stay dissolved. If you were to add any more, then your solution would, would uh, like the substance would just go to the bottom and be saturated. So if you're, um, so if you're talking about something, a, a data point that's on the line of the curve, like in this case for potassium dichromate, then you would say that that solution is saturated. Okay, and so that's what that means. Um, if, for example, I said to you at 50 degrees Celsius, we added 20 grams of the potassium dichromate, then that would tell you that the solution is unsaturated. So that's how you kind of use these solubility curves to tell you. The other thing that you have to sometimes be mindful of is if the um, amount of solvent is changing. So in this case, this particular diagram is talking about 100 grams of water. Now, if the diagram changes, so maybe it says 50 grams of water, that means that you're going to have to modify how much solute is added as well. So, for example, in this one, right, if at 50 degrees Celsius, um, I told you that I wanted to know how much uh, potassium dichromate could be added in 50 grams of water or 50 grams of the solute, right, you would have to cut that amount in half. So you would say, for example, 15 grams could be dissolved. So if you notice, these are all um, solid substances, right? So all of these substances are ionic compounds. They're all solids. Um, so all of these, for the most part, you can see as the temperature increases, the solubility increases. But as I mentioned before, there are some exceptions, like, for example, this one right down below here. If you were to study chemistry elsewhere, you would learn about kind of the energetics involved with solution formation. But that's really beyond the scope of this class at this point. Let's talk about gas solutes. So this is another graphical representation. So for gas solutes, if you notice, we're going to see the opposite trend where we're going to actually see as temperature increases, the solubility is going to decrease. Just so you know, this solubility um, uh, axis is a little strange just because it's actually, it looks like milli, uh, millimolar, but for our purposes, that's not a huge deal. Um, we can, we'll just pretend that it's similar to solubility um, that we saw on the other one. But you can see for all of these gases, all of these are gas at room temperature, the solubility is going to decrease as temperature increases. So let's talk about the rate of dissolving. So the rate of dissolving really refers to how fast a solute dissolves in a solvent, and it's not to be confused with how much. So rate could be increased by increasing the temperature, and the reason why this works is because there's more kinetic energy available to meet the activation energy or the energy available for dissolving. You could also stir the substance. That increases the interaction between the solute and the solvent, right? So they're colliding more frequently, causing it to dissolve. And then finally, you could also powder the solute, right? By powdering, you can increase the surface area of the solute, which increases the interaction between the solute and the solvent and causes it to dissolve more quickly. 
There's some terminology that you have to be familiar with um, in terms of liquid-liquid solutions. At this point, we've only been talking about solid-liquid solutions. So with liquid-liquid solutions, you may have heard the term miscible. This is what basically means that you have two liquids which uniformly mix together. So for example, milk and water. If something's considered immiscible, that's where you have two liquids that will not mix and you'll see actually layers form. So for example, oil and water. And then in chemistry, there's a general rule that we use to help us to understand what's going to be a good solute or a solvent, what's going to be able to dissolve in each other more easily. And that general rule is like dissolves like. So what that means for chemists is if you have a nonpolar solute and a nonpolar solvent, we're going to say that's miscible. If you have a polar solute and a polar solute, solvent, that's also miscible. But if you were to have two different ones, like nonpolar and polar, that is considered emissible. There's one last thing we need to talk about, and that's called concentration. Concentration indicates the amount of solute dissolved in a given quantity of solvent. When we talk about concentration, we usually use two terms. The first one is dilute, which indicates that there's a small amount of solute. And then concentrated is usually referred to as a large amount of solute that is dissolved. So those are two terms that we'll refer to, but they're very uh, qualitative in nature. They don't really give us any indication of how much of each substance we have. And so that is what we're going to explore in our next lesson. So that's it for this first lesson. As always, if you have questions, you of course want to ask your teacher. You definitely need practice on this, so I wish you luck as you begin worksheet one. Thank you so much for watching.